Hello everybody, Mr. Eck here to get you with some notes on piecewise functions. This is another one of these topics that is in section 1.3. It's kind of a section that's just all about all the different kinds of functions. Um, but piecewise functions are a pretty neat type of mathematical object uh, in that they are a function and a graph that actually comes in multiple pieces, uh, which is why they do indeed have that name piecewise functions. So in this first example, it's hardly even an example. I've already worked everything out. I just want to show you the equation and highlight the different pieces. So we notice that this is a function, right? So when I write uh, the function name, and then I actually am writing a little set bracket to say, hey, this is going to be a set of other functions. Piecewise functions are weird. You don't usually put a closing bracket after the function. You just let the one big bracket do all the work. Um, and then within that bracket, I have multiple lines, and each line is referring to a different segment of the graph. So, for example, the first line here is referring to the segment that's in blue in the graph, and the second line here is referring to the segment on the right that's in red. How do I know that? Well, I'm looking at the two pieces of the equation. Um, and you can think about the pieces. There's pieces, uh, of course, there's the lines, but there's also the part right here and the part right here. And I actually read the second part first because this tells me where to draw. The first part tells me what to draw. Um, but I actually really do find it easier to read this part first because it's nice to know where you're working before you start figuring out what it all is that you're trying to draw. Okay, so with that in mind, how does this equation create this graph? Well, first, this is saying, let's look at the first line. So this is saying f of x equals x. And when you see x, you can think about the line y equals x. So what this is saying is draw the line y equals x on your graph. And I'm imagining that this line extends off in both directions. I've already got part of it. But then I look at it and say, oh, this is only really supposed to be drawn if x is less than or equal to 1. So I erase all the extra part that I didn't need, and I stop right here at 1. Uh, by the way, this segment of the graph has a closed circle on it. And why is that? Because it was x less than or equal to 1. So specifically, the less than or equal to means that you should use a closed circle. Okay, so that's pretty much the first part of the equation taken care of. Let's look at the second part, which is graphed in red. Uh, now this one you may be less familiar with, depending on how, uh, you know, when you're watching this video in the context of our class. Uh, but I will just tell you this is a parabola. It opens downwards. And it's shifted to the right by one unit. That's what the x minus 1 does. Um, so I'm thinking about this parabola. I can think about the entire parabola kind of living out here, but I notice that this has said x needs to be greater than or equal to 1. So I'm only drawing it from 1 and uh, further to the right. Uh, right, yeah, further to the right. So I'm going to erase all the other parts of the graph. Oh. We should also observe that on this segment, it is an open circle because the equation said x was greater than 1 and specifically not including 1. So when you see a strictly greater than on one side or the other of your graph, you should always do an open circle. It is important that we did have the open and closed circles this way. I gotta get, I gotta get rid of this. All right. Fixed. It's important that we had the open and closed circles this way, because if I had had two closed circles, all of a sudden, if I try to say, is this a function by drawing a vertical line, I have failed the vertical line test. And it's no longer a function, because there would be two y values for the x value of 1. So we have to fix that by making sure that one of our circles, when two endpoints line up, or when the function has those jumps, you want to have one open circle and one closed circle. And that has to be or should be communicated in the equations, uh, in the where to draw part of the equations. 
All right, let's look at another example. So this is one where we're going to draw the graph given the functions. And I notice that there are three parts. So I'm going to have three segments on the graph. It can help before you start graphing to look at each piece and decide just what the graph will look like. So I know that this is going to be a parabola. And both of these look like lines. So I'm expecting my final product to have one parabola segment and two line segments. For the parabola segments and other curvy pieces, it can help to just kind of sketch the whole thing first. So x squared plus 1 is a parabola. I'm just going to kind of do like a dotted line uh, in both directions so I can understand the full shape of it. And then I look at where I'm supposed to graph it, and it says if x is less than 0. So uh, I will go to 0. It's less than strictly, so I'll put an open dot. And then I will shade in or just color the parabola. We go through that point right there to the left. And since it's less than 0 and doesn't stop, we put an arrow on that end. And then I'll clear off and erase the other piece. That's one approach, is kind of just sketching the whole graph and then erasing the parts you don't want. Um, now, if you're doing this on, on a computer, that's easy. If you're doing it with pencil and paper, it's a little trickier. So you may wish to have another method, and that's what I'm going to do for the second equation. The second equation, uh, y equals 1 plus x, I'm going to use the plugging in the endpoints method. This method is especially nice when you have a double inequality, like one of these segments in the middle. So you have two endpoints that you can plug in. I'm going to just make an in-out table, like x and then y, which is supposed to be 1 plus x. And then what am I going to plug in? Well, I'm going to plug in both endpoints. So I'm going to plug in 0 and get 1. And then I'm going to plug in uh, 2 and get 3. Even though this is less than and not equal to 2, I'm still going to plug that in. Because what this says is that I'm going to have a point, well, uh, point 2, 3, but with an open dot. This first one says I'm going to have the point 0, 1 with a closed dot. So by plugging in the endpoints, I can tell both like what kind of graph I'm going to have and what kind of dots I'm going to have. So now I can just plot those two points. Oh, 0, 1, I already have on the graph with the open circle. When you have a closed dot that would be on top of an open dot, just put a closed dot. Don't try to get fancy. Don't try to be cute. Just put a closed dot. Then at 2, 3, which would be up here, I'll put the open dot. It's a line segment. So I'll just connect the segments. And that's the second piece of the function. Now, I'm going to do the last piece of the function, which is negative 2x plus 5. Now, I could, of course, count up to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 and start graphing a segment. I don't feel like doing that. I don't think it's necessary. I think it's going to make my life a little harder. Oh, that makes my life harder. Get back there. Um, so for negative 2x plus 5, I'm also going to plug in the endpoint. So if x my only endpoint is x equals 2, so then uh, negative 2 times 2 plus 5 is 1. So I'm going to have the point 2 comma 1 on this graph, and I see that it's going to have a closed circle because it is less than, greater than, or equal to. So at 2, 1, I'm going to start my third segment with the closed dot, and then I can say now I know from this graph, I know the slope, I have a point, and if you have the point and you have the slope, you can start to plot out some points and you can sketch your the final segment of your graph. It should look something like that. So here is a fully drawn, drawn piecewise graph with a parabola segment, a linear increasing segment, a nice little jump, and then that decreasing segment. And notice again that we have this open circle on top of a closed circle stacked up so we never have two closed circles together, but the function is still defined everywhere. We don't have two open circles together either. Um, that can happen. It's not illegal, but it's really awkward if you have two open circles stacked on top. Um, 
I want to look at this closed dot. So when I said it before, but when two, uh, or when you have an open dot and a closed dot, just put a closed dot. Because the closed dot means that the function just reaches that value. It means the function is there. Um, do not try to get cute and do like a, like a closed dot inside of an open dot or make it look like an eye. I don't know. Don't do that. And also don't try to do like a cute little like uh, half and half dot. Those are not real mathematical symbols. This is very creative. I like your problem solving abilities. Just do a closed dot. You'll be happier in the end anyway. In this next example, we're going to write an equation for a graph that's been given to us. And I want to highlight the word an equation. There's always uh, or often multiple potential equations you could write. Uh, so we're just trying to write one. I'd encourage you to pause the video, uh, get out a pencil and think, write down what you think the equation for this might be. Uh, and then when we go over it, you'll get to check yourself. So give yourself a pause. And we're back. Thanks for pausing. Uh, now let's write the equation. Now, the first thing we want to decide when we write this equation is how many pieces it's going to be broken into. That was terrible. I, I give up. Brackets are hard. There. How many pieces this is going to be broken into? And it looks like it might be broken into two pieces, but I see something a little sneaky, which is this red piece kind of has that bend. Whenever you see a bend, you should probably be thinking about a graph that's going to be in multiple pieces to deal with that bend. So I'm going to say that this horizontal piece goes all the way to 0, 0, stops there, and then the red piece starts right after the end of that point. Um, now let's go through and look at it. So now I have three segments to look at. The first segment in green, it sure looks like it's part of a parabola. Um, why? Now, I wrote the problem, so I'm kind of cheating because I know what I, what I intended. But I noticed that if I were to continue this parabola out, y equals x squared would be a pretty good equation for this. And I also noticed that it would be only, in, only valid or only needed for x less than or equal to negative 1 y less than or equal to because it's the closed dot and negative one because that's where it is. Uh, let's go to the blue segment. So this is going to be the constant function y equals negative one. Whenever you have a, a horizontal line, that's just the equation format is just y equals, if you remember. Uh, and where will that be? That'll be from negative one is less than x is less than or equal to one. Um, you could, there's some question about whether that needs to be strictly less than or less than or equal to. Go with it for now and we'll come back to that later. And then we'll look at the red segment. This looks like a line and if I extend it back I can identify that the y-intercept would be 2. So this is going to be, or negative 2. So this is going to be y equals x minus 2. And where will this be? Uh, well this is going to be for x greater than 1. And again, there's a little bit of a question, should it be greater than or greater than or equal to? Go with me for now, we'll come to it. That's all the information you need. So we're just going to put this into the equation. So first I have f of x equals, I don't write the y equals parts, I just write x squared if x is less than or equal to minus 1, negative 1 if x is between negative 1, and 1, and it's going to be x minus 2 if uh, x is greater than 1. And that would be a pretty good equation. A couple little subtleties. I said I would talk about these. Basically the idea here is you just need to pick one of the two possibilities to have the equals to. So when I did my initial drawing, I colored in that, that point blue, and that's why I decided to make the, the blue segment be less than or equal to. Um, but as long as you're picking just one of them to have the equals to instead of both, then uh, you could, of course, flip the equals to it. This could have been x 
greater than or equal to one. And then this could have been negative one is less than X is less than one strictly. And that would have been okay as well. It doesn't really matter. Just pick one. Don't do both. Um, because if you do both, you're kind of saying, hey, this function has two values at that point. And even though they're the same value, it still just doesn't make sense. It's kind of getting into that non-function territory. So just try to avoid that. Um, someone else in one of my classes pointed out when we did this problem that I didn't actually tell you anything about the parabola. And so um, they assumed that the given point was the vertex. Now it doesn't have to be, uh, there's no, just no information in the problem. But if you assume that that given point is the vertex and that the parabola actually looks like this, then you could have a totally different equation for the parabola part. Um, it would be, what would it be? It'd be X plus one quantity squared plus one to do the shift over and up. And then you would also need a coefficient out front because it's a little skinnier than a normal parabola. It's shift, it's stretched by a factor of three. And I would accept that if this was a problem on a quiz, I'd accept both equations because there was just no given info. There two points is not actually enough to determine a parabola. You need uh, three points, three points to uniquely determine that parabola. So that's just a side note. Uh, here is a perfectly good equation though for this piecewise function. Next example is kind of an error analysis problem. Uh, say that you got this back from your teacher and they had not, they marked it wrong, but they hadn't said why. So take a second, and I think it'd be really good if you actually pause and think about it. Why is this graph incorrect? Um, and I can tell you, so we're back. I can say one reason that people often say it's incorrect is because it's missing the circles. Uh, I'm not sure that's exactly true. Um, when you're, there's nothing there, you can kind of assume that it's a closed dot at that point. Uh, it's just a really small, right? A, a line or graph is really a small closed dot. So it's not that it's missing the circles, but it is missing something. What it's missing is all of the X's between zero and one. So this person that made this graph, if this was you, was thinking, oh, the number that comes after zero has to be one. So that's where the next graph starts. But they have missed all of these numbers in between zero and one. And then the correct way to deal with this symbol is by putting an open dot at zero. That's gonna be the best way to fix this graph and then once you put the open dot at uh, two zero, or sorry, zero two, you can put a closed dot at zero zero so that everything lines up nicely. That would be the much, much better fix for this graph. If your graph has gaps, if your graph has gaps in it, it is probably has some kind of error, probably. There are piecewise graphs that have gaps in them for good reasons. But most of the time, your graph will have no gaps. Every X will be covered. There will be no strange missing bits in the middle. Or if there are, you should definitely go back and check your work. This is a really common mistake, and I see it a lot from students uh, because people just don't think about decimals. They don't think about fractions. They're only they're stuck in that first, second, third grade world of the only numbers that exist are, are positive whole numbers or integers. But we're big kids now. We know that there are more numbers than that. We know that there are so many numbers between zero and one uh, that we have to graph them. We have to include them in our graph. This is our last example of the day. And it's just uh, an example of some of the algebra you would do with a piecewise function. So this is the function we graphed earlier in example uh, two, I believe, when or whenever we graphed it, uh, maybe example one, sorry. It was example one. We graphed this earlier, but I'm going to pretend that we just had the equation now. Um, and I would show you, I'm going to show you how to plug in values into a piecewise function. Um, sometimes people think, okay, they say f of one, this is telling me to plug in one. And then what they'll do is plug in one into all three equations and give three answers. That is not the correct approach. The correct approach is to say, all right, I'm going to plug in one which equation do 
I use? So then I look right here and decide which of these equations does one fit in with? Well, I know that one is between zero and two. So I'm going to use the middle equation. And I'm gonna say, okay, the middle equation is telling me to do one plus x. So uh, f of one will equal one plus one, which gives me two. And I would say that f of one is two. That's the y value, by the way, right? When we say f of 1, these are the y values. Function notation is just, it works the same way, even though it's a piecewise function. Okay, uh, f of negative 3, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to plug in negative 3. I go to look at the conditions, and I decide which condition matches. Well, negative 3 is less than 0, so I'm going to use the top equation. So I'm going to do the equation for the top is x squared plus 1. So then I plug in negative 3, parentheses, squared plus 1. I get 9 plus 1, or 10. So f of negative 3 would give me, or should give me, positive 10. Finally, we get to the one where the most, the errors often happen, and it's one of these endpoints. f of 2. So I ask which equation do I use for x equals 2? And the, the issue is that I see that there are, of course, two equations that have a 2 involved. But only one of them includes the equals sign. So I know that 2 is more than or equal to 2, because it's equal to itself. So I'm going to use the last equation. And I can plug the value in. Uh, so f of 2 would be negative 2 times 2 plus 5, which should be negative 4 plus 5, or 1. Um, and notice how it, with each of these, I've only given one answer. So if you find yourself tempted to give two answers, it means there's either an error in your thinking or an error in the equation that's been given to you uh, because you will only ever have one value when you're evaluating a piecewise function. All right, everyone, that's it. Please let me know what questions you have. The best thing you can do to get better at piecewise functions and more comfortable with them is just graph them carefully intentionally on graph paper draw them big use the space don't try to squeeze these into the little corner of your of your notes it's not gonna do you any services well thank you all for watching i'll see you on see you next time